Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. There's a question in the chat. If they missed the first session, we'll be able to follow along with today's content. Um, Chris, do you? Uh, like yes, you will. Great. Uh, good morning <laughs> and or afternoon. And uh, yes, we're going to be starting with a review of some of the key points from the first session and then getting into some new content. While we are here and while folks are coming in, if anybody would like to share a little bit about <clears throat> where you're joining us from today or why you're joining us today, we're going to have the opportunity to talk about these within the course of the presentation too. But it's always great for me to know um, a little more about who will be in the room so that I can know I'm asking the right questions of y'all. Everyone, um, as part of, I see the questions in there, you, you, everyone will get the whole series. When the whole series closes out, you'll get all the resources, all of that. Um, everything lives as a package. So just as a FYI, um, it will be after March that you will get everything in one cohesive little toolkit. Um, and everything's hosted on the Partners for Advancing Health Equity website too. So I will kind of just bring us together and then Chris, I'm going to pass it over to you really quickly and welcome to the second part series uh the second session of our three-part series on design design thinking for design justice um and i want to just offer our thanks to chris for leading this session for us um you're such a breath of knowledge in the space and practice of design thinking so um thank you for coming again um and i'm gonna just kick it over to you um as we to get us started for today so Thank you very much, Christopher, <clears throat> and thank you to all y'all for joining. My name is Chris Dimrick. I am the facilitator of the Collaborative Design Workshop, and I am so excited to be here with y'all today for session number two of the Design Thinking for Design Justice series, which is called In the Swamp. So as you know, this is part of the Partners for Advancing Health Equity Research Learning Collaborative. Um, we call it a sprint. Um, but I hope it is not quite that exhausting. Um, we're going to be, um, yeah, taking a look through some history and some applications of design thinking and design justice today. And really excited to get going with y'all. And I believe I recognize some names and people who were here the first time, but somebody started with the question of, uh, if you didn't make the first one, will you still be here for this one? And I'll say, yes, you absolutely will. We're actually going to be doing a um, review of some of the session one content right at the beginning. For now as well, I want to say, uh, keep yourself on mute, but I may, in, there's some slides where I'll invite you to share a little bit about um, responses to the questions. They have a little speech bubble logo on them. So in those, if you'd like to share and chat a little bit. Uh, you can also write in the chat or you can unmute yourself when invited to. So the image that I picked to kick us off today is a vegetable garden at San Malo. So San Malo is a settlement in the swamps east of New Orleans. We're gonna be talking about it a bit more in today's session, but this particular image shows a vegetable garden. Uh, it's in the late 19th century. Um, thinking about in a time when some of the practices of public health that we know now are being developed, um, some of the oppressive practices in particular are being developed in the ways that we're now trying to deconstruct those forms of oppression through health. Um, what are the alternative practices of health and wellness, um, sociability, sustainability that people are already doing, even in that time. Um, I find this image inspiring because it starts to make me think about well, what are people eating? How are people staying healthy in this isolated community in the swamps? So briefly, a little bit about me. Um, I'm the facilitator of CoLab and Fiber Design Workshop. I also work as a project manager for Broad Community Connections, a community economic development nonprofit that is rooted in principles of um, public health and um, <clears throat> social determinants of health here in New Orleans. Uh, we work in the neighborhoods around Treme, uh, Seventh Ward, Mid-City, 
uh, not too far from the Tulane School of Public Health. How might we work toward the just features of our communities in the inequitable realities of the present? In these sessions, we're gonna be applying problem solving methods of design thinking for design justice. So we're gonna be learning about the social, environmental and political histories of practices of public health equity. So one thing I'll always be kind of weaving through my content here is that equity and just practices are not new. They're not a trend. They are ways that people have been approaching practices of public health or health and wellness. They might not call it public health necessarily, but these are very deeply rooted. Uh, as the inequity is deeply rooted, so are the equity uh, practices. So that's some of what we'll be exploring today. In session one, we had an introduction to design thinking and design justice. In session two, today, we're doing some deeper learning about design thinking and design justice um, and their applications in health equity work within, but not limited to, the context of New Orleans. In session three, we're going to do a bit more active practice in applying design thinking for design justice um, in more of a exercise with real world places and people. So our learning objective for today's session. Uh, by the time you're done today, you're going to be able to define the terms Black ecologies and Blues histories, which are some key concepts. If you came to the first session, you may have heard a little about them, but we're going to be digging more deeply into them today. We're going to be able to describe some origin stories of public health within and beyond white supremacist anti-Black institutions. We're going to be able to identify problems of designed injustice and opportunities to apply practices of design justice in places and communities where we practice. And we're going to be able to frame design challenges using how might we questions, which is going to be our design thinking toolkit um, lesson for today for you to add to your arsenal of design thinking tools. So we have some community norms and expectations that we're going to be practicing today. And this is particularly for engagement we're having with each other in the chat, um, things we might be saying and things we're talking about in the Padlet. So we're going to avoid assumptions. We're going to use I language, speak with care, be attentive and curious. Um, so I do encourage you to turn on your camera and to ask questions in the chat. To turn on your camera is because it makes me, it a little easier for me when I'm talking to people. Um, but also because we love for y'all to be able to see each other and to get a sense of who's in the room. But of course, if that's not possible for you, completely fine if you don't. Um, challenge yourself to make space and take space and to take care of yourself in body, mind, and spirit. So if something is not hitting you the right way, uh, if you're just not feeling quite well, um, take time you need to step away and come back. Um, certainly. If you need to go to the bathroom and get water and stuff, uh, please do so. So we're going to ground ourselves a little bit with two recognitions. Um, we're on indigenous land, of course, um, here in New Orleans. This is the land of the Chittimacha, Choctaw, and Homa people for many thousands of years. Um, if you know what the indigenous groups and people whose land you are on are, I invite you to share those in the chat now too, uh, with a little bit about what locations you're at. Um, if you don't know, uh, or if you'd like more information about that, here's a website, native-land.ca, which has a great map. And also a nice disclaimer about why mapping itself isn't necessarily a practice that can get to the whole truth of um, indigenous land stewardship. Um, use these pictures both to talk about this land, South Louisiana, what has it looked like? What does healthy land here look like when it's not being taken up by concrete and these kind of colonial um, forms of using the land, but also the people that indigenous people have been here for tens of thousands of years and are still here and the cultural traditions and politics also inform the things that we're doing here today. So we're also in on land in a place that's could not exist without stolen and devalued uh, Black people and Black lives and Black labor. So that's a heavy recognition to make here in New Orleans, Louisiana, where I know people are coming from all over the 
country and places where maybe that history isn't so much um, necessarily visible all the time here in New Orleans, it certainly is. Um, and in some ways, that's also good because it means we have to think about the implications of this injustice in all the work that we're doing here today. So here's one example of how people here in New Orleans do that, the Ma'afa, um, an annual commemoration of people who were killed in the transatlantic slave trade that happens in the um, sort of the Treme French Quarter neighborhoods in July every year. So those are heavy things to think about if we're actually taking the time to sit with them. So I invite you for a moment. I'm going to stop talking too, to close your eyes, take a breath in and a breath out. And we're going to, yeah, just think about how those two acknowledgements are woven through everything that we're going to be talking about today. And I think it's going to be fairly evident how so um, as we get into it. So now I got some questions for y'all. Um, some of y'all have already answered this in the chat, which I appreciate you doing so. Uh, what's in it for me? Why am I here? And if you were here for the first one, share a little bit about why you came back for the second one. If you do feel particularly compelled, I invite you to briefly uh, take yourself off mute and answer one of these questions. Thanks, Rakia, for sharing. <clears throat> Seemed cool opportunity to explore and understand design thinking in the context of health equity and justice. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. And Catherine um, dittoed that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I see a lot of people give um, acknowledgments and recognitions of whose land they're on in great detail, too. I appreciate that a lot. Hmm. Architecture and planning. Definitely. Those are the fields that I have been kind of primarily trained in to Elias. So uh, I think you may see some things in this presentation that draw on those fields in particular. Mm, culture of humility as a journey, not a destination. That is a really important way to think about this, Dr. Flint. Cool. We got some great responses there. Thank you all for sharing. We're gonna move on to a little recap of session one. So our key points from that first session were defining design thinking and design justice. So we define design thinking as a process for thinking through a problem, which can be used to challenge the status quo or to maintain it. Design justice is a set of practices for collective transformation of an unjust and inequitable status quo. So that does involve a recognition of where we're at now um, that the status quo is not only unjust, but unsustainable and an imperative to work for change. So you might recognize these graphics. They're actually kind of ubiquitous throughout the work I'm going to be doing in this series. And I think my work generally, I draw on them a lot. So get comfortable with them. This is from the Design Justice Network, set of 10 principles. And the Black Space Manifesto from the, this is actually an architecture planning sort of centered uh, organization, uh, Black Space, it's one of those practitioners come out of, but these principles are also very applicable throughout all fields. Um, you will also find these both in the Padlet down at the bottom when we share that. It's a good reference. So in session one, here were some of our key takeaways, define the terms, describe some historical context, describe the values we bring to our work as practitioners in our fields. And we talked about how current systems in which we practice are unjust, why, and then some really key points, which is who benefits and who's harmed. We're actually going to get the opportunity to consider these questions again in our reflection today, because they are important. For today's session, we had some media that was shared, um, a read, watch, listen opportunity. There was a couple of readings, a video. Um, and a podcast episode. I'd love to ask if anybody took the, if anybody had the time to read some of these, um, to watch or listen, what your reactions were and what's something you might've learned. And again, uh, you're invited to take yourself off mute and to share 
couple words if you'd like to. I will add that the themes of a lot of these um, media that we shared out with y'all um, for today is that these histories which come from the specific ecology of this place, um, New Orleans, are really important in the politics of healthcare, wellness, and health practices. Um, they are kind of specific to this place in these readings, but one thing we're going to be doing in today's session is uh, talking about how these specific lessons can be applied in a variety of places. Because I know that many of y'all are coming from a wide variety of places too. Um, if you had the chance to, or even if you didn't have the chance to watch Dr. Jim Downs uh, talk about his book, uh, Dead in the Water, A New Origin Story of Public Health, I really recommend it. Um, just re-watching it last night to prep for this. And it's very thought-provoking. Um, reframing where public health comes from, why the discipline was created and how it spread, um, especially sort of through the field of tropical medicine uh, in the sort of era of colonization. And so I know at Tulane particularly, that's sort of a, as it's part of the identity and history of the school, as I'll we'll talk about a little bit, um, yeah, important to be considering. All right. First, I think, um, you know, I was, I read the one by Dr. Husby, um, yeah. and I found it really poignant in terms of talking about New Orleans and like who is New Orleans serving in its decision making in terms of the economy of tourism, right? Mm -hmm. Economy of, developers and the building of hotels and higher like right these things that are not serving necessarily the local people of New Orleans especially displacement right post Katrina but rather it's serving an elite group of people with capital and money <laughs> and resources who are continuing to reify a system of oppression here locally Thanks for sharing that, Christopher. Um, yeah, and I saw there's there's a ask to briefly summarize, which I'm happy to do too. Um, Dr. Allen in Living Your Freedom Through the Marine Landscape, she's talking about, well, actually touching that a little bit in the first section here, but about the, she's a landscape architect and she's talking about how the um, plants and ecology of the swamps and to the east of New Orleans uh, were fertile ground for Maroons, people who escaped from enslavement and liberated themselves and lived free in the swamps, how they were basically practicing landscape architecture, how they were shaping the environment to live in safety and in freedom in that environment in a very challenging place. Um, and she starts to talk a little bit about health and uh, the health practices of this group of people as well. Um, Dr. Hosby, as Christopher said, is talking about sort of the development politics of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And he is talking about who it serves and who it doesn't, but he's also talking about cultural practices of resilience, especially uh, sort of deeply rooted in black working class New Orleans that help people survive all of that hostility. Um, Dr. Sylvian Diouf, um, in more than a runaway, which is a great segment. Uh, it's just a about like an eight minute podcast. So when you're on the train, if you have a train, I hope you have a train, or in the car, like we are here in New Orleans. Um, yeah, give that a listen. It's a great little introduction to more about maroons and the landscape that they've lived in, not only in Louisiana but actually across the Caribbean and places where people were enslaved. And then Dr. Jim Downs, yeah, he's talking about connections between the development of medical science and public health, um, the trade and enslaved people, also the abolitionist movements, and really bringing it all the way up to date in current racial justice activism. So um, yeah, that one's more like an hour lecture where he's talking about the book, but a uh, great piece. He has a couple other books too. He's kind of a historian of... Um, Public Health, the Civil War, and Reconstruction, which I think is an especially important era to be focusing on, because it was really the first time when the U.S. government actually committed any kind of money toward public health. 
um, and is the root of a lot of things that have happened in terms of like government funding for healthcare really came out of that era of reconstruction. All right. Ah, somebody was mentioned in the chat. They were able to read and listen a little bit. Mm, yeah. There's just some really good points about how being hidden and isolated doesn't necessarily mean you're cut off from other people. It just means that that happens in some creative ways. So we have pre-session survey as well. Thank you to those who took it, if you did. Um, then you got a little bit of prompt questions for thinking about today's content. Um, also, it had the same demographic information that folks who filled it out the first time, if you came to the first session, would have given, which helps me get a better understanding of who's coming in some depth as I shape the curriculum for each of these. All right, so our participatory tool for today is Padlet. Christopher, or sorry, another one of the team, um, is going to be sharing a little bit about that and how it works. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, so Padlet is a lovely little tool that we use, and folks who came to the first session got to experience it. Um, and basically, it's just a tool for us to kind of ask questions, converse, and capture ideas. Um, you know, as we are going through the session, it's really simple to use. You will um, find in the link that I just dropped um, information from the first session, and then if you scroll down, we're in session two. Um, and we have some kind of interactive activities there for later, but we'll ask you to post comments, um, reflections, you can use imagery as well um, to kind of share how you're feeling. Um, and then all of this, we're going to collate and kind of keep it all together um, as we go into session three. And then everything, we kind of synthesize everything. Everything's going to live as a lovely little toolkit for you all that we will send out after the third session kind of curate all these resources, put it all together um, so that you all can reference it and use it in your spaces moving forward. Um, very, we want to make this a very applied tool um, for your future um, kind of planning work that you're all doing. So if you have questions as you're working, using it, um, let me know, but it's not too hard. You can just post comments. If you double click, you can add little notes, feelings, thoughts um, as, uh, as we go along. So, the framing of today's session, we are, as mentioned from the first one, carrying this forward. Design thinking for design justice is rooted in a recognition of historical injustice and inequity, and in the efforts of people who have fought and continue to fight for justice, equity, and liberation throughout history. So the title of this session in the swamp references the swamp of political, social, and ecological conditions in which we work. But Oftentimes, the idea of the swamp has been is used in a sort of pejorative or negative way, and I'm talking about the swamp in a different way, the way that if you got to see some of that history of the Maroons and what we talk about with San Malo, the swamp is actually a place, it's very fertile, first of all, in an ecological way. It's, it's very rich, um, lots of plants, animals, um, including ones with all these healthcare applications grow in a swamp. And it's a fertile site of resistance, too, to oppressive practices past, present, and future. In a very real sense, too, there is no New Orleans without a swamp. Um, it's something we have fought back against in trying to create a city out of this place. But ultimately, we're still just a city that's built on top of a swamp. You can't get rid of a swamp. Uh, that's why it floods. So for those who are practicing here especially, I invite you to think about that frame of a swamp like what are the good things that could come out of being in a swamp um, to reframe many of the challenges that we have about living here. And that's also true of other places too. I think, especially around the Caribbean, I noticed there was somebody here from Puerto Rico and um, sort of New Orleans connections, especially in the world of public health, go across the Caribbean and across the Atlantic to West Africa, um, where there's a lot of those same kind of ecological and political challenges. So situating New Orleans in a swamp rather than in say like, the United States, I think, also opens up some possibilities for um, people also occasionally will use the term like third world to describe New Orleans. That's a term with a lot of problems about the way it was created and what it means and what it applies. So I think swamp is also potentially more of a positive framing on the challenging environment and the challenging um, ecology of a place like New Orleans or I think global south could also be a term that 
maybe has some better implications. It's often used there. All right. If you were at session one, you may recognize this slide too. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, a framing concept for sorry. Huh. Yep. So through this one. Uh, we're gonna be talking about a framing concept, blues epistemologies. So this sculpture, Spirit House by Martin Payton, um, is located in New Orleans, in sort of the edge of the Gentilly neighborhood on St. Bernard Avenue to say circle. And it is a piece of public art that was created to talk about the African American experience in New Orleans, specifically the cultural, the very, very diverse range of cultural influences that came to make this place, to make this city. It uses the built form of the shotgun house to um, encapsulate that. The richness of the culture is represented on the panels of the shotgun house, buttressed by this architectural form from Europe and North Africa, um, the flying buttress that you see in churches. So this is a bit of an architectural and sculptural metaphor for some of the concepts we'll be talking about around cultural mixing and the power that comes out of acknowledging how our culture is made from these very diverse influences. So Dr. Clyde Woods, um, the author and scholar who coined this term, describes it as place-based knowledge of local natural resources, economies, histories, and structures of feeling that transcend place to connect people based on experiences of oppression. So he's talking here about people who are from different places in the same place, as well as people in different places around the world who are connected by these similar experiences. So to the point about like New Orleans being situated in the Caribbean or the global South, um, also in the United States and in Louisiana, um, there's shared experiences that people in these places have, which connect us and which we can use as sources of power as we do this important work. So I use the term ecology here to talk about more than just plants, um, to talk about the politics and the society of this place. Um, plants are important because it's all happening in a, an environmental location too, but this is a brief uh, list of some of the social cultural groups that make up the culture of this place. Um, we often collapse some of these. Uh, we're very familiar with like the French and the Spanish influences. People have heard of the French Quarter. There's a whole thing. Um, those influences on New Orleans culture are very well recognized. There's an Irish channel. Um, but just because those are named does not mean that the others are less important. Um, Clyde Woods and his scholarship especially digs into the political and social traditions of the Yoruba, the Mende, Akan, Bebara, Congo, and other West African cultural groups who were collapsed into Black um, when they were enslaved and brought to this place. And that's a very important act of reclamation because he's giving much more attention to what influences those people brought here in a specific way and drawing those connections back. Also, not simply from Africa to Louisiana, but also through the Caribbean, um, through Haiti and through Cuba and through these other places that New Orleans has been connected to and that these people came through. And then because of these links across um, sort of the colonial map, there's also been these very old presences of people from other places, like the Philippines, for example, So I'll talk about in just a moment. So now we're going to get to San Malo. Um, if you read Dr. Jones Allen's piece, uh, you may recognize this diagram. She was writing primarily about Bayou Bienvenue wetlands. So this is New Orleans here um, with the Crescent of the Mississippi River. Bayou Bienvenue is to the east between the city uh, St. Bernard Parish, it's actually mostly in St. Bernard Parish, and uh, Lake Bourne. So out on the edge of that, on the Lake Bourne edge, is where the community of San Malo was located. So San Malo was established by primarily uh, sort of attributed to one man named Juan San Malo 
who was escaped. Uh, he was born in West Africa and escaped from enslavement uh, on a plantation along the river and sort of founded, created this community of up to its largest about 500 people who lived in the swamps um, during the 18th and into the early 19th centuries. Um, they were environmentally, um, culturally, socially self-sufficient to differing extents. Some people lived permanently in the swamp. Some people came back and forth to stay connected with family, friends, and contacts in the city and on the plantations. But this was a place where people who liberated themselves from enslavement were creating a society that was both independent of the colonial space, but also deeply connected with indigenous space and indigenous people because the Chittimacha um, and other groups who lived in this area were the ones who took them in, who provided support, um, allyship, uh, resources, knowledge, going back uh, to the earliest colonial days to enslaved Africans who escaped. And so the culture that they built was also much more than the French and Spanish culture, sort of integral with the um, indigenous cultures at this place. Um, I didn't put a picture of black masking Indians because there's lots of pictures of them. I hope you know what they look like. Um, but if you're familiar with black masking Indians in New Orleans, um, this cultural tradition that happens a couple of times a year, particularly around Mardi Gras, it's a celebration of exactly that history of the connections between uh, indigenous black resistance to white supremacy and colonialism. So here's a little excerpt from one of Dr. Duke's uh, pieces in Dr. Jones Allen's article about some of the plants found in the ecology of the swamps and how they start to be healthcare, how indigenous and indigenous knowledge informed the Africans who were living in the swamp and it started to help them find medicines, to find food, to find uh, ways that they could treat themselves and treat each other when they needed healthcare because they were not going to get much out of going to the city where they would be enslaved. Like there was no possibility of going to find medical care in a traditional way in New Orleans. And so they had to create alternatives to that system in the swamps. Because yes, as Dr. Downs uh, was talking about in his um, sort of concept of the slave ship is the origin of modern public health, which also references a lot and should have put it in here, how much he's talking about Sadia Hartman's work um, is sort of a foundation of his own. Um, in her kind of, kind of iconic phrase, the slave ship is the belly of the world. Um, yeah, and he frames it as the origin story, the origin location of public health. And of course, the institutions that we have here in New Orleans and across um, our country today are rooted in this era and also rooted in this economy and rooted in those practices. So this is an ad from Turo, what we now call Turo Hospital from 1853, advertising the services that they provided to enslavers for operations and care on enslaved people. And this was absolutely there's another great WWNO tripod at New Orleans at 300 podcast about this. Uh, it's the same series that the Maroons one was in. Um, it was economically vital to early New Orleans healthcare institutions that they treat enslaved people. Um, they were not treating enslaved people as people. I use that phrase because for reasons we kind of talked about in the first one, but they were treating them as slaves. They were treating them as unpaid workers. They were treating them as sources of capital and sources of income for the people who claim to own them. And so that's how they were providing healthcare. They were providing sort of a bare minimum of healthcare services that was necessary for people to survive, but not actually for people to thrive and not for people to do anything more than reproduce capital. Um, Dr. Downs calls the way that this interacted with medical research too is commodified death, that this was a boom time for medical research because it wasn't just people dying as like poor people had been dying in European uh, institutions and slums for centuries. But now that there was economic value attached to these enslaved workers, there was much more reason for um, the people who enslaved them to invest in institutions and 
the technology to care for them as workers. So this did lead to a boom in medical research and innovation, as well as some of this public health, initial public health research was very useful to abolitionists, um, which is another side of it that Dr. Downs speaks on quite well, that the famous Brooks slave ship diagram which was used by abolitionists was also used by early public health researchers um, to make a case for the necessity of fresh air for people to say that like we've seen what this does to people when there's no fresh air, it's not human, it's not possible to survive in these conditions, we need to improve. Um, not only how we're treating people in this context and argue for abolition of enslavement, but we need to improve our public health practices too. So I've already got to a little bit of this, um, but want to work it into the roots of this institution in a little bit as well. And I mean this in a way that is in no way an attack on the institution of Tulane University, but just an acknowledgement that this is where we're starting from. And if we want to go somewhere else, we have to confront it. That, um, yeah, we may have heard of the phrase uh, drapedomania before. It was a disease that a doctor in New Orleans named Samuel Cartwright came up with. It was a mental condition that he said enslaved people who tried to run away were suffering from this condition and that this happened when they were treated too well. So it's a good example, I think, of medicine and medical knowledge being created not only out of white supremacy, but out of like an imperative to reproduce capital and to... Um, yeah, to kind of convince enslavers that they shouldn't treat the people they enslaved well because that was going to lead to this disease. And so you have to treat them worse and feed them less and things like that. So he was a professor at the Medical College of Louisiana, an antecedent institution of Tulane, and became kind of like a national public health expert um, talking about this. There's also worked into the roots of many of these institutions, medical experimentation on enslaved and free black people and corpse theft, which I've learned a lot more about 19th century medical history recently. And whew, there was a lot of that um, going on in basically all of the institutions that we now like have today, all the big institutional hospitals and universities were getting their bodies from in very um, unsavory ways. And these legacies are still, even if the institutions and the hospitals and the universities choose to forget and not think about them, they are still very much in the body of knowledge that the descendants of the people who were enslaved have. There's a lack of trust often. Um, this has been documented and written about quite a bit. Um, sort of the trust gap between many of these institutions and the people who they serve or who they claim to serve, but especially because these histories of experimentation and theft of bodies uh, are well known and sort of passed down. Um, I think it is important for equity and just practices to recognize not only that they're known, but sort of to confront it and to work towards some repair around that issue. So we're kind of popping back and forth here between the history of oppression and the history of resistance and liberation, um, but that's how it should work. Um, this is a couple of the names and faces of people you may have heard of um, and institutions. Uh, Dr. James Durham, who was sometimes credited as the first Black doctor in the United States, actually was in New Orleans for a couple of decades, uh, enslaved working for a position um, from the uh, I think 1780s to the early 19th century when he disappeared um, from the historical record. But that makes New Orleans one of the oldest places, uh, the one of the places where there has been Black people, even in a traditionally recognized way, practicing medicine um, in the United States. Um, Marie Laveau, a figure who we're probably all, especially in New Orleans, familiar with to some extent, has also been framed by some scholars as a medical practitioner, particularly because of the ways that voodoo and the African, Afro-Caribbean and Creole uh, Louisiana spiritual practices for which she's better known often included sort of health and wellness aspects to them that 
were not necessarily recognized by a medical establishment, but were also forms of health care that the people who she worked with, people in her community were receiving. Um, and then kind of going back to the more sort of traditionally recognized healthcare practitioners, uh, Dr. Louis Charles Rudinet was part of a family of free people of color in New Orleans who not only um, they received their medical, him and his brother um, received their medical education in France, because that's if you were a free black person um, in pre-emancipation New Orleans, you had to go to Europe, but then also practice medicine as advocates and activists here. Um, Dr. Rudinet and his brother founded the Tribune, the first uh, black newspaper in the United States, and were civil rights act activists and advocates throughout the late 19th century um, in New Orleans, and part of the political tradition that later led to Homer Plessy, the Citizens Committee, Brown v. Board of Education, all of that um, tradition of activism. And then we had the institutions too. So out of Reconstruction, um, we had the origins of the two existing Black uh, medical schools at Howard and Meharry, as well as like, there were another five around the South at various points. But one of those was Flint Goodridge Hospital here in New Orleans, which if you came to the first session, got to hear a little bit about, and which we'll talk a little more about today. So back to the other side. We're thinking about who shaped the medical institutions we have today. Um, and when exactly. Reconstruction ended in 1876 uh, with the contested election. And at that point, white supremacist ex-Confederates kind of took over government, but also all the other institutions of society here in Louisiana uh, and the South. So one of those was the medical institutions. Uh, the Orleans Parish Medical Society, which still exists today, I believe many doctors uh, belong to it, um, was created as a specifically whites only institution by doctors who had previously been Confederates and many Confederate surgeons. Um, these people advocated for racial segregation at Charity Hospital, which had been integrated for almost two decades at that point, or for more than a decade at that point. And many private hospitals, which had treated enslaved people on the basis of their enslavers needing the demand for labor, they refused to treat free, free black patients at all. Um, this picture has a particular historical resonance to me because this is the uh, medical school at Tulane University in 1909, Richardson Memorial Hall. Later, this was the architecture school. So this is the building where I received my own education at Tulane. Um, you can see who's there, uh, that it's all white men. And we know that that's by policy of the university that there were only white men who only white men could attend in a building that was also named for one of those ex Confederate doctors, a doctor who was actually the um, doctor of the Confederate Army of the Tennessee, I believe. So, still called that. Um, one aspect of equity in the present, too, is thinking about how these kinds of names. Uh, what they communicate, what a failure to change them communicates about institutional priorities. And so that's one way that we can work for equity in the future too, is to acknowledge through renaming and that sort of reconciliation process, um, some of these histories. In opposition to those traditions, uh, we had activists who designed some really innovative solutions. Um, there were these segregated hospitals. There were also black doctors and black nurses and black practitioners who created black hospitals, which are often called that, though in reality, they were really integrated. Um, they were hospitals that were in black communities, often primarily served black patients, but white patients, certainly at the hospitals in New Orleans, like Flint Goodridge, they were not turned away. It was an institution for poor people, um, in addition to being an institution for black people of all social classes. Um, the origins of emergency medical transport in sort of a, a black um, civil rights organization in Pittsburgh are one example of sort of an innovative activist solution. Um, prior to the creation of the Freedom House Ambulance Service in Pittsburgh, medical transport services were usually offered by um, morgue or um, sorry, funeral homes, which is, as many people pointed out, a bit of a conflict of interest as well as police 
which for black communities meant that a lot of people were simply not getting medical transport services when they needed them. And so Freedom House was created by civil rights advocates, um, white and black doctors in Pittsburgh to provide medical transport uh, with a black staff, uh, people who were often excluded from employment opportunities, um, training, and then really creating this first service that also sort of spread and became the model for medical transport around the United States. More locally, we may be familiar with the name Aretha Castle Haley. Um, she was a civil rights activist. She was a student activist specifically from the age of like 15. She was an organizer of sit-ins and boycotts and protests against segregated stores in New Orleans. And then continued to pursue uh, activism for racial justice, essentially, as an administrator of Charity Hospital, um, as a administrator of public health uh, initiatives, particularly around sickle cell anemia in the 1970s and 1980s. So her career trajectory, I find really interesting because it also shows that like, you know, there are many younger people who are activists and advocates today who are protesting, who are marching, and it's not always evident, like, how do I, it's something I've struggled with a lot too, is like, how do I turn those interests into a career? Um, and Aretha Castle Haley is one person who absolutely did that. Um, here is a poem by Kalama Yasalam, New Orleans uh, artist, activist, talking a little bit about Aretha Castle Haley's philosophies on an impact on the healthcare system in New Orleans. So I'm going to read this briefly. She was a leader in championing public health care. Saddle up warriors, she commanded and led the charge for affordable health and medications, a battle that sooner or later we all needed to wage, whether as patient or advocate or both. And we know that the reality of healthcare provision in New Orleans now has changed a lot since her time too. Charity hospitals have been closed. The redevelopment process is happening through Tulane. Uh, we have the University Medical Center, a private institution kind of as its replacement. Um, but yeah, even though that's the larger narrative, it's important to remember that there are people like her who continued fighting for these priorities of affordable, accessible healthcare and medications. So we're going to touch now a little bit more on Black ecologies. So folks who've been in New Orleans for a little bit may recognize and remember this mural. Um, it's by Brandon B. Mike Odoms. It existed on the former Grand Movie Theater in New Orleans East at Lake Forest Plaza from 2015 until 2019 when it was demolished. Um, this mural shows the faces of and talks a little bit about people of New Orleans East um, in a way that they are not always dignified or respected, especially unlike the city level. If you live here in New Orleans, as we'll get into, we'll talk about the ways this part of the city is viewed as disposable, as criminal, as not a place whose people are worthy of respect, investment, or healthcare. Um, but this artwork, I think, is a great response to that because it is presenting a very different image of what this place is and who lives here. So the scholars who really kind of define the term Black ecologies are Justin Hosby and J.T. Rohn. So they call it a way of historicizing and analyzing the ongoing reality of the Black communities in the United States and in the wider African diaspora are most susceptible to the effects of climate change, including rising sea levels, subsidence, sinking land, as well as the ongoing effects of toxic stewardship. Black Ecologies names the body of insurgent knowledge produced by these same communities, which we hold to have bearing on how we should historicize the current crisis and how we conceive of features outside of destruction. So through both Black Ecologies and Blues Epistemologies, there is a lot of attention to whose voice are we listening to and who gets to say what the problem is, who gets to define the issues, um, who gets to talk, uh, who gets to speak on what's happening. Um, both recognize cultural production like music and art as necessary to incorporate into our work and scholarship, 
because if we're not seeing what people are saying their music and art, we're leaving out what a lot of people who don't have access to academia or who are push, who are denied access to academia um, are saying. Um, so blues and blues epistemologies actually comes from the musical form, the blues, but it's not exclusive to that. It also includes um, sort of descendants of that within musical traditions like hip hop and rap. And so here's a lyric that I will not read um, from Lil Wayne's song, Georgia Bush, um, which I think it came out in about 2008. And it was a way that he, uh, Lil Wayne, Dwayne Carter, New Orleans rapper, um, was telling the story of what was done to New Orleans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in his voice and from his experience as a person coming from a disinvested Black New Orleans neighborhood. Uh, so he's talking about his own experience, the experiences of people in his family, people he knows, um, and using the cultural power that he's built as a musician to communicate that in a way that it was often not being heard by people who talked about, oh, it's a great opportunity to wipe the slate clean and to create like a new, smaller, wider city. Um, and people said things just about that explicit a lot in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Um, yeah, so if we're looking for where these resistance ideas are and the resistance to this erasure and destruction, it's necessary that we look at what artists are saying. Um, the map from Hosby and Roan's piece um, shows sort of statistically the same thing that Wayne is saying in the lyric, which is how many Black residents of New Orleans have been pushed out and were not able to return um, from these neighborhoods uh, that were sort of condemned and not invested in after the storm. I think also sort of speaking to people who died, people who lost their lives in the storm and the aftermath, especially because health institutions were not, um, did not come back. And so important to consider sort of the communication between these two forms of knowledge, like the academic and the cultural. So a little more about New Orleans East. Um, it's a place folks may be familiar with, especially if you're here, but also if you live in another place, every city has, uh, in the United States really has a neighborhood like New Orleans East. Um, especially sort of now as we come into the 21st century, a lot of these 1960s, 1970s suburban, we call them often like inner ring suburbs, uh, originally created sometimes on an explicitly segregated basis as whites only, sometimes a little less explicit after the Civil Rights Act, but still kind of conceived of and developed as white space. Um, this neighborhood was also developed in a swamp, um, kind of the same swamp where San Malo was, um, on a different part of it, closer to um, Lake Pontchartrain shore. And so New Orleans East was, the swamps were drained, the city was built there, um, these neighborhoods, this industrial area uh, where people could work, uh, for usually like middle-class white people. Um, with the end of the oil boom in New Orleans in the 1980s, and also sort of the rising black middle-class after the civil rights uh, movement, um, white residents left New Orleans East over a couple of decades and it became black space. And so it became a place where there's black people of all social classes, but particularly like kind of as far as New Orleans goes, like, it's not Atlanta, it's not Dallas, but it does also have a black middle class and black upper class. Um, people who moved into these neighborhoods, um, bought the houses, uh, spruced them up. Um, but we're also faced with a disinvestment where the kinds of stores, the kinds of uh, businesses and resources that the white neighborhoods had, they left when black people moved in. Um, that includes medical services. And Hurricane Katrina, which happened in 2005, of course, like meant that it was so much easier for institutions to pull out. Um, there had been a hospital in the center of New Orleans East called Pendleton Memorial Methodist, and it was closed after the storm in 2005 and then not reopened until 2014. So this area of the city that's cut off by water from other parts of the city, uh, where about 40,000 people live, had no hospital for nearly 10 years. <laughs> 
when it had been developed as a neighborhood with a hospital, with actually more than one hospital um, for white people. But then here it is as a black neighborhood with no hospital for nearly 10 years. Um, the sort of economic centers, including Lake Forest Plaza Mall, uh, were also demolished after the storm rather than receiving investment to be renovated and spruced up. Um, all of that was erased basically. And so if you go there today, you'll see like empty fields where the mall was and where this mural was. Uh, but I think it's important to include the mural again to say that like, even if real estate developers, even if like the government isn't investing in a place like this, people will still find a way to invest and to celebrate uh, the people who live there and the culture. And this mural is an example of that. So to go a little bit more specifically into healthcare and creative response as well, um, curious if folks may be familiar with the 15 White Coats. Um, it is a organization that was created essentially, I think out of this image or in a series of images that were taken in the same photo shoot in December, 2019 by this group of 15 medical students. Um, I'm actually not sure if any of them were in public health, um, but I think most of them were in the Tulane Medical School. Um, in the fall of 2019, and I think this image had a particular resonance because of what happened three months later with the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic and the very, very immediate recognition that there's a vast disparity in the ways Black communities were suffering from the pandemic um, and white communities. And so there's a recognition like, oh, there's not much care within a lot of medical institutions for the ways Black people are experiencing this COVID pandemic. Um, where are the Black doctors? Where are the people who can offer this kind of care? And so I think, though they'd taken this image and already gotten some recognition for it, the organization they created, 15 White Coats, really came up in the summer of 2020 as a response to that. And of course, to the other, the wave of activism that happened in the summer of 2020 as well. Um, and I'd say that this is an example of what Justin Hosby is talking about. Um, by creating that compelling image and by then building a community based on the people of the people for whom that image resonated and then kind of keeping themselves together as a group for taking that image, creating an organization that provides scholarships and sort of mutual aid support for black medical students and for people who are interested in studying medicine, but not in medical school who are black. Um, they're practicing some of these things that Justin Hosby is talking about. Um, and as some of them are from New Orleans in the area too, um, also kind of being involved in the community, um, doing things like giving talks and, um, yeah, being present at places like the New Orleans East Hospital, which was reopened in 2014 following the, um, that nine year gap of there not being a hospital in New Orleans East. The New Orleans East Hospital today is kind of recognized as one of the few hospitals in the United States to have an all black executive suite and leadership and has been recognized as a leader, especially since the pandemic in like thoughtful providing ways of providing outreach and healthcare services to that community, but it's still also very under-resourced. This is also New Orleans only actual public hospital. It is part of the LCMC system, but it's publicly owned unlike the, um, yeah, the privatizements. Okay. So we're going to move into the design thinking toolkit portion, the how might we question. So how might we question, if you're familiar with design thinking, um, you already know it. it is a pretty simple concept. So I'm excited to talk about it with y'all. And we're going to be doing it in a way that's historically informed. So this image might not be what we usually think about when we consider design thinking. Um, but I put it here because when I look closely at the words on the banner, I recognized especially words like New Orleans Opportunity Challenge, champion of uh, health. They're similar to the ways we sometimes frame things we're doing in design thinking today. And the campaign that the fundraising committee for Flint Gearbridge Hospital was doing is not that different from a lot of the, especially like equity focused design thinking um, campaigns, advocacy campaigns, people are using design thinking to put together today. 
And so I want to propose that this hospital, this institution that these people are sustaining, the way that it was created, we can actually look back at that and apply design thinking methodology to think about the process that the women who did it um, were using to get there. And to acknowledge and credit those women as um, design thinkers, even though they may not have been called that at the time. So how might we ultimately is a technique for problem definition. So how might we question helps us move toward the ideation or experimental action phase of the design thinking process. They can help us create boundaries and set intentions. So this is, you may recognize it from last session, Creative Reaction Lab's equity-centered community design process. I don't think there's any design thinking worth doing that's not equity-centered. Um, so I continue to reference and apply to this one. Um, though it's not the only equity center process out there, I think it's a pretty good one. And you can see at the arrow where, how might we questions can fall in. Once we've begun to acknowledge and dismantle power constructs and think about history and healing, um, which is an ongoing process, but once you've started doing those things, then we can begin to define the boundaries and the intentions of how we're gonna confront the problem. That's where how might we questions come in. So one way I sometimes like to do it is framing it is a framing these questions as a pair of two opposing questions. So what are we working for and what are we working against? Example would be, and these are drawing on some of the language from the readings, particularly like a phrase from Justin Hosby. Um, how might we design health programs which affirm Black life in New Orleans? How might we design health programs which resist the death dealing of racial capitalism? So our case study is the Phyllis Wheatley Club of New Orleans. Um, here's some of the people, the women um, who kind of were affiliated with its descendant, the Flint Bridge Hospital. Um, I could not find any specific image of the Phyllis Wheatley Club from the 1890s in New Orleans, but there were photos. Of, there are photos you can find online of other Phyllis Wheatley Clubs. So um, Phyllis Wheatley Club is a group of Black New Orleans women, sort of mostly um, like middle class, professional class, but also had some members who were sort of across the social spectrum coming together in 1894. And Phyllis Wheatley Clubs were a national movement, part of the Black Women's Club, Black Club Women's Movement of the 1880s and 1890s, um, sort of across social work, public health, advocacy, education in different forms. And so this particular group was interested in public health. They were defining some problems. Income restrictions prevented poor black patients from accessing care at segregated white run charity hospital. And Jim Crow policies designed by those early parish med medical society physicians in the 1870s prevented black doctors from working at white hospitals. So these are some of the constraints. These are some of the challenges these women are facing. And these are some questions that they may have asked themselves framed as how might we. How might we improve access to healthcare for Black New Orleanians who have low or no income? And also not just Black New Orleanians, but they were specifically focused on that. They were also thinking about all New Orleanians. Um, how might we oppose Jim Crow denial of medical training opportunities for Black doctors in New Orleans? So here's some of what they did. Um, they fundraised through their club. They founded the Phyllis Wheatley Sanitarium and Training Hospital for Nurses, which offered a two-year nursing program with free tuition and board for full-time students funded through philanthropic contributions. They offered through the sanitarium and hospital free care for low-income patients, black and white. And it was the only hospital in the deep south with black doctors. If you came to oh, session one, then you may have learned a bit about the Flint Goodrich Hospital, later part of Joad University. Um, I won't go into all that detail today, but I will say, um, yeah, this is kind of the origin story of that. Um, how did there get to be a Black hospital in New Orleans? It's because this group of women came, of Black women came together, defined problems, and saw solutions to them. And you too can use how might we questions to define problems and seek solutions. In fact, we're going to do that right now in the Padlet. So 
going to give you the opportunity to practice using how might we questions. Given the time constraint, I think we may do a little more like three minutes. Three minutes, yeah. Yeah, thanks for asking that. Kara, uh, Kara had a question in uh, the kind of chat. Oh, yes. And, um, Thank you. What is the advantage or purpose of like that specific phrasing? How might we um, versus, or mm -hmm. in other words, is it this the same effect of what are our goals? Um, that's a great question. I was actually just using this in the Padlet. <laughs> um, yeah. where, like this offered to me a lot of future thinking. Mm -hmm outside of any like what is my output like if I'm like thinking as an evaluator a logic model like right you're looking at this like output outcomes versus like the impact um mm -hmm. is where this kind of like lets me sit and live with and like really thinking about what is this future yeah like that's the word thank you Amanda yes future is <laughs> um yeah I think the future orientation which is not to say an exclusively future orientation, but it does allow for that look at the future um, is one reason why it's useful. I see some folks trying it out in the Padlet. As I'm catching up in the chat, I notice um, Avis, thank you for sharing a little bit about the program that New Orleans East Hospital and Ashe have created. Um, Ava says, New Orleans East Hospital and Ashe Cultural Arts Center had developed an innovative system of utilizing culture bearers and artists to impact health and wellness outcomes with a holistic view of social determinants of health. This utilizes trusted messengers that are culturally respected. All right, I see some answers coming in. I'm glad y'all are finding this helpful. I'm gonna move on sort of into our closing Reflections. Um, yeah. So again, we can always come back to these as references, the Design Justice Network principles and the Black Space Manifesto, um, some of the concepts that are outlined here. Yeah. Um, Shan is still asked if I could re-explain re the opposing questions part. Um, that is a concept that I have added because it allows us to think about the duality of there's both like action that we're taking and there's a system that we're opposing. So we can define positively what we're doing and we can define like what it is we're up against. So here is we're getting to the reflections. Um, also recognizing it is coming up on 115, which I believe is our ending time. Um, We'd love to invite anyone who wants to stay for about another five minutes to do so, but of course you are already giving up a lot of your time on this busy day. So we appreciate your being here for as long as you can be. Um, yeah, so these are just some reflective questions to see how y'all are receiving some of this content. So I invite you to respond in the Padlet with how you define these and also the values questions, which I'm carrying over from the first one, because I think it's always important to see how on different days at different times, we might be reflecting on different values. I think I will actually skip through to our closing now. So yeah, this uh, actually one of our readings for next session is about the program that was that Avis mentioned earlier. So. It's a piece from the Kresge Foundation talking, one of the funders of that project, talking about um, how it works. And here's a photo from it. So thank you all so much for coming. Take a moment to breathe again. Um, if you are still here, would invite you to share how you're feeling in the chat. And you can do it in one word or phrase if you like. See, so you were resourced, curious, enlightened. Thank you all for sharing. Um, so in this session, we defined the terms Black ecologies and blues histories. We described origins of public health within and beyond these types of institutions. We identified problems 
of design and justice and opportunities to apply practices of design justice in places and communities where we work. And we framed design challenges using how might we questions. I think Rihanna also shared the link to this in the chat, but would invite you to snap a photo of it with your phone and you can take the end of workshop survey. I really appreciate what Flint wrote in there. <laughs> yes, Flint said, is, is black history. Hashtag American history is black history. It is, and especially New Orleans. All right, I call it homework. Of course, I can't make you do the reading, but I would invite you to because they're good readings. Um, so the first one by Kaniqua Welch is about that ASHE program, um, which is training artists, culture bearers as health outreach workers. Um, the second is a Q&A with Nupur Chowdhury of Dark Matter University, which is a design justice educators organization. Um, Nupur Chowdhury is a public health urbanist. And so she applies some of these issues in, she kind of bridges between um, the fields of public health, urban design and planning, um, working mostly out of New York. Uh, Black Future Heritage Spaces by Ladipo Fomodu is a sort of case study of a workshop on which mine is modeled a little bit, on which the one we're gonna do in session three is modeled a little bit. Um, so it's a speculative design workshop um, that he's writing about that he facilitated. And then the last is a video with Rupa Maria and Deanna Van Buren who are talking about designing features for health and justice. Rupa Maria is a public health practitioner and Deanna Van Buren is an architect known mostly for her organization. Designing justice, designing spaces, spaces which applies sort of principles and politics of prison abolitionism to architecture and the built environment. So one of the challenges that they work with is how do we reuse spaces that were used for to harm people in ways that have a lot to do with health, like prisons? Um, how do we reuse those spaces and reclaim them and use them to repair and help people instead of hurt people? All right, so for session three, Wednesday, March 27th, we really hope to see you back. This one's called Preferable Futures. So in the first two, I've done a good bit of talking. I will do a little bit of talking in the third one, but we're going to do breakout rooms in which we will be taking some of this history and context and applying it to specific problems, trying to find the... And we what I'll be talking about is like speculative design as a practice. So we'll be trying to seek preferable features in the theoretical exercise. So Thank you so much for coming. That is it for today. And I skipped over the slide for it, but if anybody does have any other questions for me, feel free to take yourself off mute and ask them or ask them in the chat. I'll be here for another couple minutes. Chris, thank you so much for um, the presentation and Christopher as well. Um, so I don't even know if this, let me come off video. Uh, I tripped a breaker in my house, so I lost a few things. I'm trying to get everything set back up again, but nevertheless, um, I'm just curious. Like when you first started talking about design thinking and you know, doing the going over the definitions and whatnot, I don't know why it popped in my head, but I'm just curious to, to ask. You know, when when I started to think about environment for for whatever reason, I thought about the underground black. I mean, the underground railroad. Mm -hmm. And just wondered if you had anything to say about that. And does it have any relationship to what you're talking about as we think about history, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, I think there was a lot of creativity that people who were organizers and participated in the Underground Railroad were applying to the problem that they were facing uh, or to the many problems they were facing because they were facing like the human danger of oppression and escaping from enslavement and plantations they were also facing ecological problems like what we were talking about with the maroons of like they had to cross these treacherous landscapes a lot of them went through swamps because those were the places where it was harder for people to um like to catch them when they were making escapes and so 
I think that does overlap a bit with what we're talking about. And it helps us to see like how these histories of like innovative ideas of like how you design a program and how you shape something actually go back a really long way. Like the underground railroad was also like a pretty organized operation, right? Like it had like people who were raising money for it in the North and people who were like transmitting the money very secretively to the South to get people out. So and Chris I would just love to see that. more. Yeah. And maybe do you know more about like writing on that, maybe how that can be applied that way, but I, I'm sure that there's a lot there. Oh, even to today. Like if you think about everything that's happening with abortion mm, yeah. uh, and everything that's happening with like liter I've started calling people like language that I'm using when I speak to people is I've started calling people like refugees, like internal refugees in the United States. Yeah. The fact that like there's people fleeing and I have like an LGBT issues, right? Like people who are particularly trans um, identifying folks who are literally fleeing from the South to go North. Like this is not normal. Like, in the, like we're seeing another, like there's migration happening because of how we're structuring our environments in certain locales. And it's quite fascinating yeah. and, not, and kind of like, you know, just, and disturbing. I would say though, it's hard to say it's not normal if there is so much historical precedent for it. Like yeah, the historical yeah, norm yeah, is that yeah. there's these kind of oppression that's happening. Yeah. And that is one thing that gives me a little bit more hope is that when we look at these histories, we find that people have been using really creative strategies to resist them for a long time. Um, if the norm is these conditions of oppression, then there's also a norm of like resistance, survival, even thriving in the space of those conditions. And so, yeah. um, I appreciate that. 